Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we're going to explore the alien RPG scenario Hope's Last Day. Published in 2019 and included with the Alien Core book is an introductory scenario for both players and game mothers. I always appreciate it when a publisher includes an introductory scenario in their core book. It's a way to show how their adventure should be laid out and a way to kind of walk all of us through the first game. So thank you very much to Free League for including that in the core book. The scenario is short, coming in at only 15 pages, and is a simple one-act cinematic scenario playable in just a single session. I think my group and I, we took just a little under four hours to complete the whole thing, and that was with introducing a few people to Alien for the first time so it is a pretty short adventure. It ties very closely to the movie Aliens, taking place in the colony of Hadley's Hope, as we get to explore the final hours before the colonies fall and find out if any survivors manage to escape it. The scenario provides us with five pre-generated characters to use, each with their own talents and personal agendas. We also have a map of the complex. Now, like with all the maps in the Alien game, I find the retro sci-fi styling to make it a bit difficult to read. They also provide us with this green version, which I find a bit easier to read, and this is available as a free download on the Free League website. They also have this printer-friendly version, which I find the easiest one of these to read. Players, of course, should have access to this map up front. Their characters live here after all, and they should be pretty familiar with how the place is laid out. Game masters might even want to determine or let the players choose which sublevel housing unit belongs to their characters, kind of personalize it a bit. That way the PC can look at it and go, that room right there is mine. Now, the backstory and the setup is given to this adventure just up front for game masters to either read or hand to their players before the game begins, so I don't see any spoiler problems with going ahead and sharing it right now. The scenario opens four days after the first infection has hit Hadley's Hope. Several colonists have become infected, and a few may have died, according to some rumors, as some sort of snake-like parasites escaped these people and disappeared into the vents. Now, 24 hours ago, our five heroes were sent out to do maintenance on one of the processing units. Their big tractor broke down about 10 kilometers out, and Hadley's Hope has radioed them to hold tight and wait. Now, shortly before they left to do this maintenance run, a team of Wayland yutani corps arrived in a shuttle. One of the player characters overheard these Wayland yutani corps saying that they were going to be loading for departure and leaving all the colonists behind. Look, guys, we know that Russ Jordan, Newt's dad, was sent out to that derelict spaceship on company orders when he got infected. And for all we know, those two company goods are the same ones that sent old Russ out there in the first place. So I say, we get a hold of one of those access key cards, we take that shit for ourselves, and we get the hell out of here. The scenario opens after our five heroes have decided to walk back to Hadley's Hope, get the key cards from one of these Wayland yutani corps, and steal the shuttle for themselves. So what I'm going to do is offer my tips and my criticisms and suggestions as a game master who has successfully run this adventure. And I'm Jack, the artificial player character, but you can just call me Jack the NPC. I'm here to give it to you from a player's side of things as we determine if anyone made it out of Hadley's Hope alive, but also answer the burning question, who was it that bagged one of Ripley's bad guys in that passageway? But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. But send your game masters this way to see about running this adventure for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, your shame will last until an alien bursts from your chest. Okay, Game Masters, let's get this thing going. As I said, the game gives us five pre-generated characters, each with their own buddies, rivals, and personal agendas. Now, the adventure itself is more of a dungeon crawl than anything else, and outside of the alien threat, these agendas are going to give us most of our drama, so I suggest that you also go ahead and fill all this out in character sheets and hand those character sheets to your players. Or you can download the ones that I've already filled out for my players, links below if you just want to use those. Any unused characters, I suggest that you keep around as NPCs, uh, maybe to kill them off in some sort of dramatic fashion at the very beginning of it, or to be available to use as backup characters because one of the PCs might easily get killed themselves and they need a character to play now. In addition to those, we have two NPC profiles that the characters might encounter inside. However, the adventure also gives us a third, Maria Hemming, who can be found in Tannen's Casino, but she isn't given a profile for whatever reason. 
Now, if they find her, she is going to be unconscious at that time because she was face hugged, but Game Masters can easily have her wake up shortly after and begin interacting with the PCs. Again, I suggest that you fill out character sheets for these NPCs so they could be used as backup characters if you like. Once again, I already did that when I ran it myself, so you can download mine if you want to use those. Now, one of the player characters, Holroyd, is an android. But being that he only has one name instead of a first and a last name, I assume that him being an android is pretty common knowledge among all the people of Hadley's Hope. But we only know that one PC for certain knows that he's an android, and that's Singleton, the Whalen yutani sleeper agent. Which means that if you choose to have him being an android be a secret, it can be a pretty dramatic moment when the rest of the player characters discover that their buddy he wasn't even human. The adventure opens as the PCs arrive in the West Airlock. They already know that they need to get one of the two key cards to unlock the shuttle to escape, and that the most likely spots to find them are either going to be in the office blocks of C2 or E1. Now, a few gripes with this map. First, the stairs are difficult to tell if they're going up or down. Also, the stairs or ladder in the West Airlock isn't clear if that's supposed to be there, if it's maybe a roof access or something like that. And finally, the landing pad is sort of small and doesn't show the shuttle that's on it. Now for that one, I made this map for my group. However, one fan out there has addressed all of that for his game, and he updated the maps to denote which direction ladders and stairs lead, as well as a much prettier map of the landing pad that also shows the shuttle. So I stuck a link below to download those maps of his if you want to use them. It doesn't really matter which ones you use, as long as they're the ones that work best for you. But whichever one you do use, I suggest that before the game, you just go ahead and mark on your GM map, just go ahead and mark where all the aliens are located. We have several face huggers, some drone xenomorphs, and one scout xenomorph. Now there could be more than this if you wish, to maybe have an alien show up at some dramatic moment, uh, maybe to encourage the PCs to keep moving if they're just kind of stalling and sticking around in one place too long. Or maybe you could have the PCs see them on some monitors, or maybe see them outside the window and the PCs you know, have to duck down before the alien sees them back. Well, the adventure says that they should start once they've already entered the West Airlock. I say you go ahead and start it before they enter the airlock, because maybe they'll decide that they want to take a different entrance inside the complex. Whichever entrance they use, they're not going to encounter anyone inside, just a recorded voice repeating the same message over the intercom. This is an emergency message. All colonists must immediately assemble at the main storeroom on the sub-level for safety. Well, you guys think we should go down there? Maybe we could... <laughs> Nah, I'm good. I say we just stick to the original plan. Now, the PCs don't have much weaponry between them. Basically, two pistols, a knife, and a cutting torch. Which sounds like the title of a great murder TV sitcom, doesn't it? But if the player characters take the time to search rooms as they pass through them, they can find some pretty useful equipment here. Now, Singleton has a motion tracker, which is useful, as the first alien that they'll encounter, providing they came in through the West Airlock, is going to be a face hugger. Now, for whatever reason, my players never thought about turning their motion tracker on when I ran this game for them, which means that that first encounter was a pretty big surprise. Right, Jack? Jack? I'm sure it'll be fine. Now, if one of the player characters do get face hugged, they're going to be rendered unconscious. Then they're going to awaken a little bit later on, only to last one shift before the chest burster scene. But according to the information that the player characters know at the start of the adventure, they might not know that, or they might not know that being face hugged is pretty much a death sentence. Because I saved any unused pre generated characters to be used as backup characters, I merely handed the player the next character in line. That way they could uh, keep playing the game and keep having fun. So the party was then carrying around their unconscious friend, trying to get them to the med bay for most of the rest of the adventure because they were going to try to see if they could get this thing off of them and get them fixed up or anything like that. But then once they got to the med bay, they found out the truth that it was a death sentence, and that's when they learned it was a lost cause. So they left their friend behind and they got to watch on the monitor as the thing came bursting out of their friend's chest. Now, on the bright side, they did remember to diligently use their motion tracker after that, so, you know, there at least was a silver lining to the whole thing. Motion trackers are just hearing those aliens scuttle around inside the vents. That is a fantastic way to motivate player movement. Sort of a hint saying, hey, there's something coming your way. You might want to get out of here before it arrives. Of course, if the players are dumb enough to stick around and see what happens once it gets there, that's their fault for what happens as a result. The only location that the PCs really have to go to is the second floor med lab. 
Comiskey is trapped inside, and she has been face-hugged, but she's not going to divulge that information to the PCs. She's going to try to get to the ship and get frozen, trying to hope that maybe a scientist on the other side can be able to cure her before she dies from this thing. But she is going to inform the PCs what future awaits anyone that's been face-hugged, because she's going to say to leave them behind. If the player characters do make good use of their motion tracker, most of the aliens can be pretty easily avoided throughout this place, you know, maybe requiring that the player characters, you know, go around or go through certain different places in order to avoid any sort of alien threat. More of a roundabout means than just going the straight path directly to wherever they want to go. I'd also say that they might come up with some not-so-obvious ways of trying to move around this place, such as climbing along the outside of the building and using an access panel, or maybe using their cutting torch to find or make a new way in. Several of the player characters are roughnecks, so they do have the skills if they want to do this, and they should all be pretty familiar with the layout of this place and the very, very deep inner workings of this place because they've been living and maintaining this place for many, many years. So game mothers, just go ahead and be ready to adapt to whatever ideas that your players throw at you as far as a, a, an alternative means that they might want to move around the complex in order to avoid any aliens. Also remember that the aliens might try all that stuff too. I mean, we know they're already crawling around inside the vents, so it ain't that far-fetched that they're going to be crawling around the exterior of the building. So go ahead and let your players figure out whichever weird way it is that they want to make their way through the complex, because no way they try is going to be perfectly safe. Also, while we do get the starting point to several of the aliens that are inside this complex, they might move around a bit to investigate if there's any noises or anything that the player characters are making. Might? No. The aliens should be moving around to investigate any sounds. Smart player characters might use that to their advantage. You know, they set up some sort of strange sound to go on inside a room, and then when the alien comes along to check out what made that noise, the PCs then slam and lock the door and hustle on past before that thing can escape. There are two big things that can draw this adventure out and make it a little bit more than just being a simple obstacle course. The first one of those is events. We have several events, such as Wes calling for help from inside the bar, or Kaminsky or any of the other impregnated NPCs giving birth to a chestburster. I also suggest that you might want to add some other events to this, such as a, a cry for help from down on the sub-level somewhere, you know, maybe someone trapped inside a supply closet. This gives a good moral dilemma to the PCs to see if they want to go down there to maybe save this person, and it's up to you to decide if that caller is even going to be alive by the time the player characters get down there if they decide to go. Remember, all the PCs in Hadley's Hope, with the exception of anyone that showed up with that crew with the Weyland yutani unit, they all know each other. They're neighbors, they're friends, so they should actually feel a little bit of a moral obligation to go save some of these people. Except for maybe some jerk who used to play at cards, you know, that guy can die. But everybody else, they're their friends that they've been living with for God knows how long. And the second thing that can spice this adventure up is personal agendas. Some of the agendas are helpful to the group, while one is willing to betray the party. One thinks that this is a test from God, and they're probably going to attack any aliens that they encounter, while another wants to smuggle a live specimen out of here in order to further their career. I suggest that you give agendas to the NPCs that they use. Not only would that, you know, make those characters a lot more real and act like characters because they have their own agendas, but also if you do use those NPCs as backup characters for the players, you've already got their agenda written out. That way the player can pick up this character and they know exactly how it is that they're supposed to play this person. Once the PCs have the key card or anything else they might want, they should go ahead and head out to the landing pad where the shuttle awaits. The shuttle is said to hold 20. That way it's plenty of room for all the heroes, but also any survivors that they might find along the way if you want to add anybody for them to rescue. Though I think it might be interesting if the shuttle might not have enough seats for everybody. You know, Maybe if you've got four berths and there's only five characters and they have to figure out who is it that's not getting a berth. Now, that's no big deal if one of the PCs happens to be an android. You know, They can just chill and play Candy Crush or whatever for the duration of the flight because they don't actually need a berth. But if there are less berths than humans, that might be interesting exactly to see what the player characters are going to do about that. Now, the race to the shuttle part should be frantic, as several aliens are scuttling along the rocks, you know, trying to get up to the PCs, and the PCs know that they've got to hurry, otherwise they're going to get torn apart, and they know there's no time to waste. They can't explore any of these other buildings. They have to get just straight to the shuttle and get inside and get the hell out of here. Now, the final fight is once the shuttle doors open. 
The whale and Yutani scientists stored several eggs aboard the shuttle in order to get them out of there, but the coolant that they used to keep these things from hatching, you know, failed or didn't last as long as they were expecting it to, so the facehuggers got out of those eggs. The module says that there should be one facehugger per character, and they're going to attack the PCs the moment the shuttle doors open. And this part ended up being the toughest fight in the entire adventure for us. First, the player characters couldn't avoid this fight. Even if their motion tractors warned them that there was something moving inside, they've got to go through that door and they can't go around it. And second, the number of opponents, the fact there's as many opponents as there are characters, that made that fight a bit frantic because everyone was occupied with a different facehugger and they couldn't uh, join forces in order to take out one bad guy or two bad guys, each of them had a problem of their own. That and the acid blood. Last thing that we needed was to finally get to this shuttle and have some blood get on the hull and start eating its way through the hull and destroy our only chance of escape. So we are fighting all these things off on the loading ramp, and the loading ramp is just coming apart underneath our feet, and we are scared out of our minds that somebody's going to splash some blood up on the hull and ruin our only ticket out of here. Remember that, Seth? Seth? Um, I'm sure I'll be okay. Overall, Hope's Last Day is an okay adventure. It's not bad, but it's not amazing either. It really could have used a few more optional events that Game Masters could throw at their characters, or just a full second act that the players get to enjoy, or just had a few more obstacles along the way, such as a barricaded or sealed up passages, and the player characters have to find a different way around because what they thought was an accurate map to what this place looks like ain't accurate no more to what it looks like now. Game Masters definitely prepare for this adventure. Mark where all the aliens start on your personal map, that way you don't have to start looking that up in the middle of the game where it's written in the text. Have backup characters ready for all the players. Also be cheat sheets for my players of all the various equipment, that way we wouldn't have to slow the game down to look anything up. All the prep you can do beforehand, go ahead and do it beforehand, because once the adventure starts, you're going to have to improvise and adapt to whatever it is the players and the players' dice start throwing at you. I enjoy that the adventure really does touch on one of the Aliens films, making it feel like it's actually part of the Aliens story that's from all the movies, versus Cherry to the Gods that felt like it was more of a separated story that just happened to take place in that shared universe. Personally, though, I feel this adventure is just a little bit too simple. Like, if we had an additional task, such as they have to repair a tractor and then go out and get parts or fuel for the shuttle, and then they have to take all that stuff back in order to escape, just one extra task that they had to do I think could have added a lot more to this adventure. Or maybe have them have to fight or confront another group of colonists that had the same idea of stealing the shuttle. And maybe this could be one out through roleplay or maybe violence, but it does lead to another dilemma where where they're now having to go up against other human beings who might also be their co-workers and friends, and they have to figure out who it is that's going to survive this and who is going to escape. Are they going to work together? Or are they going to have to fight this one out? But either way, one or two additional tasks would not only just show the versatility of the alien game by allowing kind of a, a wider set of skills to be usable by the players and for the game masters to see how this could be used in future adventures that they might want to write, but it also make the adventure just a little bit more than being a chase through a maze that our heroes already have the map to that maze, so it's not as exciting of a chase through a maze if they already know what the place looks like. However, we still had a lot of fun playing this adventure, which in the end, that's the only thing that really matters, is that we had fun playing it. And as I mentioned, it comes free inside the rule book, which is pretty nice. So if you've got the rule book, then you already have this adventure, so you might as well just go ahead and give it a spin. I just feel that it wouldn't have taken much to make this scenario more than it is. On a separate note, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to my buddy George for making this leather facehugger mask for me to use in this scenario review. Longtime viewers might recognize him as JJ from our Two Headed Serpent campaign, or Jax from the Mystery of BT SHT 365 campaign diary. He was played by Mustache Mike in both my Scott Brown and What Bug War stories. He's been a close friend of mine for many years, and he sells these masks at his Etsy store, so if you want one, or any of his other leather goods that he makes, just go ahead and drop by. I stuck a link below to it. Maybe drop him a line saying Scott Brown or Bombshell or something, so that way he knows who's in them. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews, RPG philosophy, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day. You know, 
What I think would be a fun twist on this adventure is that instead of using any of the pre-generated characters, all of the PCs are kid archetypes, like a class of a bunch of 10 to 13 year old school kids and maybe one adult teacher, but that teacher gets taken out in the first couple minutes of the adventure. So now you got a bunch of kids running around Hadley's Hope trying to figure out how the hell to get out of here. I mean, yeah, they'd still need to have at least one person that can know how to pilot the ship, but I think that would be a lot of fun and maybe- <laughs>